This video looks at the variational approach to general relativity and we will derive the Einstein field equations using a variational approach, both with and without matter. So we need an action S for gravitation that leads to the field equations. And we'll do that first in the absence of any matter and energy. Now in the absence of any matter and energy, we only have space-time and any curvature that, that, that it might possess. So we need a Lagrangian as a scalar function of the metric and its derivatives. Now the simplest such scalar, and the only one it turns out, is the Ricci scalar. And we can obtain this from the Riemann tensor. So our Lagrangian, L, will be the Ricci scalar, R. So the action is the integral over the four-dimensional space-time of the Lagrangian times the metric determinant, which is just the integral of the Ricci scalar times the metric determinant. Now the integral is taken over the whole of space-time, if it converges. If it doesn't converge, then we can take it over an arbitrarily large but compact region, and the end result will still be the field equations. All right, the variation of the action requires that delta s is zero. Now delta s is delta of the integral up here. This business here. Now the Ricci scalar r can be written in terms of the Ricci tensor, R mu nu, second order tensor, times the inverse metric G, contravariant indices mu nu, or upper indices. Now bring the delta inside the integral sign, and then we need to vary this entire integrand here. Okay, so using the product rule, the Leibniz rule, we get the, in, uh, the variation of the inverse metric times all this, plus the variation of the metric determinant here times that, and then finally the variation of the Ricci tensor times all that. Okay, when we do all that, collect that out, move some things around to make it more convenient. Right down here, we get this now. From a previous video, uh, we've seen the variation of the metric determinant, and that's just this result in here, this minus a half times the square root of the metric determinant, times the uh, g mu nu, times the variation of the inverse metric, times the Ricci scalar, and then the rest as before. All right. From here, we can factorize out the variation of the inverse metric and the inverse metric here, so that goes out here, and all these terms are collected. And then it's up to us to now investigate this final term here. Now ultimately, this will go to zero, it will drop off, and the next uh, sections will be concerned with showing how that happens. Okay, so the Riemann tensor is this object up here, all right? Contracting to the Ricci tensor becomes this object here, contracting on the first and third indices, gives us this object. Varying it then gives us this, so that's the partial derivative here times the variance of the affine connection minus the partial derivative times the variance of this affine connection, and then each of these, there's two variation terms for each of these terms here. That's all down here. Now if you look at that here, these first two partial derivatives here suggest the difference between two covariant derivatives. Now it turns out that that's the case. And we'll see that next. All right. Now, given this here, all we've done is we've uh, expanded this out and we'll see where this comes from shortly. All right, both of these terms here, this is the covariant derivative of this object here, this is the variance of the affine connection, and the one index up, two indices down, and that accounts for these terms here. All right, uh, and we'll see shortly how that's done. Same down here, these two terms, when we subtract them, the second from the first, we end up with this object, which is exactly what we had on the previous page. So that's the variance of the Ricci tensor. All right. So we can say the variance of the Ricci tensor is this, these two covariant derivatives here, one subtracted from the other. And relabeling an index gives a term needed for the action integral given earlier. So we're going to relabel some indices here in terms of mu nu. Okay, 
Now, how do we get this result? Because we'll be using this to see how that last term in the action integral went to zero. So we need a, a bit of information first. The Nabla or Dell operator in component form is this object here, basis vector contravariant and the partial derivative. Uh, the affine connections are related here. The partial derivative of the covariant basis vector gives this object here, and the partial derivative of the contravariant basis vector gives this object here. So what we want to do is express the argument of the derivative in its tensor basis form and carry out the appropriate operations, which is what's going to happen next. Okay, so we want the covariant derivative of this object here. All right, let's expand it out in basis form. Okay, using the tensor product here, that's what that times object is. But just to save space, we'll drop it in the future lines here. When we expand that out, we're going to want the partial derivative of each of these objects in turn of this, and then this basis vector, then of this basis vector, and then of this basis vector, producing altogether four terms. So the partial derivative of that and the rest, and the partial derivative of the next object, this one, and the partial derivative of the next object, this one, and the partial derivative of this final basis vector here. All right, there we go. Partial derivative of that object there. Okay, now the Partial derivative here of this object gives us this affine connection term here. And then the partial derivative of this object here, contravariant basis vector, will give us this affine connection here with the minus. And then the partial derivative of this contravariant basis vector will give us this affine connection here with the minus sign. All right. Next object is next goal, next line down, we want to factorise out all the basis vectors. So we might have to do some index changes. And that's what we've had to do. We've got E lambda, E rho, E nu, E mu. Right, now over here, we've got the nu, we've got the mu, we've got the lambda, but we've got an alpha here. So what we can do is this alpha and this alpha can be swapped with this row and this row here. And what we end up with is alpha, alpha, but row here, row here. And then these basis vectors are the same as this one. And we do the same over here as well. We don't want this alpha. So this alpha and this alpha can be swapped. And we can have with this new and this new to give us new and new. Okay, and then E lambda, E nu, E rho, E mu, just as we have up here. Then finally over here, get rid of this alpha and this alpha, and swap it with mu, this mu and this mu, and that gives us down here, so that we have E lambda, E mu, E rho, E mu, and now we can factorise out the basis vectors. So here they are factorised out in this last line, and this is the covariant derivative in component form of this object here. So the component form of this object here is in the square brackets. There it is. Next line over, the component form is this. Rewriting it again. All right, now if we do some substitutions, if we change lambda to alpha and rho to alpha, we get this object here. If we then change lambda to beta and rho to alpha, we get this object here. Next step is going back to that final integral that we were wondering about earlier. This object in here can now be expressed in terms of the result on the previous page. All right, and again, one more. We're going to do one more index change so we can factorise out the Nabla operator here, the differential operator here, and we'll have it in terms of alpha. So if you look here, we've got a new here, and we'd like to turn that into alpha. And so what we do is we're going to make a substitution new and new. We'll swap places with alpha and alpha because we're free to label the indices as we choose as long as we're consistent. So we get alpha, alpha instead of mu, mu. We get alpha, alpha. And here we get mu, mu instead of alpha, alpha. Then we can factorize out the Nabla operator. And we're left with this object here, which as you can see, g mu nu cancels, uh, sums out mu nu here. And we're left with just an alpha index. And same over here. 
So we'll, uh, because the mu and the nu sum out, they disappear. The mu and mu sum out here, and we're left with just alpha. So we're left with a rank, a tensor of rank one, and that's this object here, this vector here, and this looks very much like the divergence because this is an integral over all uh, four-dimensional space-time. So it's over the volume of space-time, the four-dimensional, as you can see here, four-dimensional, and so it looks like we can use the divergence theorem here. Our right, divergence theorem. So we've got some boundary here. This surface here represents a boundary and it contains a volume, a region, V, and S is the boundary. So the divergence theorem is the divergence del dot A of the vector A integrated over the whole volume is the same as the vector dotted with the normal to the surface, the outward pointing normal, uh, integrated over the surface. So these results are the same. So in generalized coordinates, that becomes this object here becomes just this. Now this is the metric in four-dimensional space-time. This is the induced metric over three dimensions because we've dropped one dimension. Just as in the vector case we drop down uh, one dimension, one dimension, sorry, we also drop down one here. And this is the induced metric when one variable is dropped. So we've gone from four dimensions down to three. When we do that, in this particular problem, this uh, surface integral is now taken over the boundary of space-time where we've set the variation to zero. So integrating this, the variation is zero over the boundary, and so this whole integral goes to zero, which means that this volume integral goes to zero, which means that that term we saw in the action earlier, the third term, uh, a few pages back, goes to zero and disappears. And that gives us the following variation in the action, which is this object here. All right. Now setting delta s to zero, and given that the variation of the inverse metric is totally arbitrary, we get the Einstein field equations in vacuo. That's in the absence of any matter or energy. So we get this object here at zero. Now these, these equations, there's four of them that will result from here, uh, most often. Uh, describe a space-time region that is empty of matter and energy. Now, we can also write the above variation in terms of its functional derivative, being delta s is again here, is our action integral again, but we can write the bit in brackets as being delta s on delta g mu nu. So the variation in the action due to the variation in the inverse metric. Times the inverse metric times this volume element here. Now that tells us that everything contained in this integral here is or 1 over the square root of the metric times delta s on the variation of s with respect to the variation in the inverse metric is just the Einstein field equation. This bit in here, the integrand. Alright. Next step. Now we consider a space time that is not empty but contains matter. So we need to add a second action term for matter uh, to the Einstein Hilbert action, which from now on we'll just label S with um, subscript EH for Einstein Hilbert. So our new action is S is this object here. Notice the constants here, that means that makes the uh, situation work out. I won't go into that now. There's just a condition that makes the uh, equations work out. Now, varying the action gives one on the square root, uh, one on the square root of the inverse me uh, of the metric. Sorry, is delta s on delta g mu nu is this object here? It works out to be zero. That implies that this object in here, which we already know that this delta s Einstein helper over delta g mu nu times this object gives us the uh, Einstein equations in vacuum times the constant, the constants which normalize it, plus this object here, this new object that we haven't seen before. And that's due to the matter, that's the variation of the matter action with respect to the inverse metric times this object here. That will give us something. So rearranging that gives 
this object here is equal to this. Now the expression on the right contains the energy momentum tensor, T subscript mu nu, and is defined as this object here. That is the energy momentum tensor. If we substitute that in for the above expression up here, we end up with the familiar Einstein field equations, which give us the curvature of space-time on the left and the matter energy distribution or content on the, of our space-time on the right-hand side here. Now the familiar Einstein field equations. And that's it.